Welcome back to the channel, everybody. So when you dip your toe into simulation, whether it be flight or racing, you quickly realize the incredible potential for near total immersion with the addition of a VR headset. If you have followed the progression of VR hardware over the past few years, it will be very clear that there have been leaps and bounds in capability. This right here is the Vario XR4. Now, Vario boldly claims that this headset is the leader in not only the resolution of the screens inside the headset, but also on the outside with 20 megapixel pass-through cameras capable of an insane 51 pixels per degree and autofocus. Oh, okay. Autofocus is only available on the $10,000 version. Gotcha. The pass-through isn't 51 PPD. That's also on the expensive one. So what's this one then? 33 PPD. I see. Cool, 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 cool. Is this $4,000 headset taking VR in the right direction with its human eye resolution optics, spatial audio, inside out tracking, eye tracking, and much, much more? Or is this just a hollow platform to showcase a handful of top tier hardware? I'm Jesse, this is Bartman's Bits, and today we are taking a deep dive into the XR4. Now this did release a while ago, and the reason why I didn't make a video right away when I got it was because the unit that I received had like this weird grid pattern on it. So I had to get a replacement unit. And now that I have, I've been able to test it with the newest software as well, and we'll get into that a little bit later. So before getting into the meat and potatoes of the review, let's compare the specs between the Arrow, one of the best headsets out there for simulation, and the XR4. All right, let's go over comfort. The XR4 shies away from the typical facial interfaces like the Quest 3 and Pimax Crystal, opting for no pressure around your eyes and nose, and all of the headset weight resting on your forehead. I find this to be more comfortable for longer sessions with one caveat. This design is not great for movement. The supporting method for something like the Quest 3 brings the headset tight up against your face, keeping it secure for rapid movement. And that's kind of the point of those headsets because they are completely wireless or disconnected, standalone. So you are expected to be doing quite a bit of movement with those. Not so much with this. The XR4 is supported much higher on your forehead, allowing for the headset to rotate left and right if you move your head quickly. In a long flight or a race around the track, your head really isn't moving too much. So for my application, it wasn't really an issue. PC VR users that play games require movement may find this really annoying. Adjustment for the XR4 is done using a wheel at the back that moves the rear pad back and forth. As mentioned before, the headset is supported mostly on your forehead using this mesh pad here up on top. Now that also has its own adjustment to move the optics up and down. I have some major concerns with the construction of the side pieces here as the thickness allows for some serious flexing. Just take a look at this. I'll put it up here so it focuses. Look at that. You can, it just sounds like it's gonna break. And that is a $4,000 headset. IPD adjustment is automatic. Uh, when you put the headset on for the first time, it does adjust for your eyes. There's also a way to bring the lens closer or further away with a button on the right side. Control within the headset for things like volume, eye tracking calibration, and other features is done through a touch bar on the side. I found this to be finicky at best and frustrating when trying to accomplish Simple tasks like increasing or decreasing the volume. I am not planning on using the XR4 for anything other than simulation. So the use of mixed reality cameras isn't really that much of a concern for me. But for people that do plan on using pass-through cameras, you will be severely disappointed. There are two problems. One, the low light capability of the cameras use is very, very poor. Let's compare it to the Quest 3, which I feel is the absolute best option for pass-through right now aside from the Apple Vision Pro. Walking around my studio is easy with the Quest 3 and I can grab objects and see screens without any difficulty. The XR4, I can barely make out what is on the screens. There's a decent amount of lag and the image is grainy and dark. The second problem is the way that Vario has decided to use foveated rendering for the pass-through. There is a box that is higher resolution, which moves around with your eyes. 
The problem is there is a delay in this movement. It's not smooth. What this does is creates this sickening movement that gave me an instant headache and motion sickness when trying to move around the room. It's also not big enough to trick your eyes. There, there needs to be a certain percentage of that box where everything else kind of blends away in your peripherals. Not the case for this. It's small enough that the main part of your vision sees the line between high quality and low quality. And that just adds to the eye fatigue and more motion sickness. You know what? I'm gonna add a third issue with the pass-through. There is some sort of softening going on that really just mucks up the final image that's presented to your eyes. It's like they're trying to make it look less grainy in lower light conditions by adding some noise reduction. Maybe that's why there is a delay. Final verdict, not good. These issues make the pass-through just pretty much useless. A far cry from the human eye level of resolution that the marketing promised. Now, it's great that Vario has listened to the gripes of the community and added speakers to the XR4, something that was definitely missing in the Aero. This is part of that complete package out of the box experience they are trying to market. Vario doesn't say too much about the specs and only claims DTS, spatial, audio, compatible. Now, I am absolutely no audio expert, but I'm pretty sure that just about every pair of headphones in existence is compatible with DTS spatial audio. As far as the quality of the audio, I give it a solid meh. The over-ear headphones like the Valve Index and more recently the DMAS add-on for the Pimax Crystal are the gold standard for VR audio. And anything else just seems to be okay. In my opinion, if you're designing a headset that isn't going to be standalone, put the over-ear speakers on it and then make them detachable for those that want to use headphones. Done. Okay, so this is a test of the Vario XR4 microphone. Uh, it took me a while to get this set up. It does not record your voice when you're using the bass that is showing here on the screen. Um, so I had to go in through OBS and set up an audio capture to uh, capture the input. But now that I got that set up, how does it sound? Does it sound like a typical gaming headset where it's kind of nasally, tinny, and not that great? Or did they get something right here with this microphone? It is noise canceling and I do have a computer down um, by my feet here. That's an open test bench, so you can see it right there. And it is quite noisy, so if I pause for a second, If you can hear those fans going, then the noise canceling isn't working that great. But if it did mute that, then awesome. That's a thumbs up for the microphone here. So which one is it? Thumbs up or thumbs down? Powered by Razer. What does that mean? Seriously, if you're going to throw a name like Razer on there, why don't you explain what that collaboration actually does for the product? Maybe it's because these aren't really that great and Razer didn't want to take full credit for this failure. The main thing that is wrong with these is all the basic ergonomics. Having fondled many a controller in my time, I can say that this is one of the worst. It starts out with a great idea. So great in fact that it was used by Valve many, many years before this. Strap on the index controllers, wraps around your hand and has a crucial bit of adjustment which allows for the different hand sizes to get the controller in the ideal position. The XR4, as the same style of strap, but deletes the adjustment option. The result is the controller only fitting in one specific orientation, which for me, put my thumb in an awkward position for the joystick. The buttons on the controller are, they're okay. They're a little spongy. They have a, a very clear click to them. I wouldn't say they're great or bad. They're just kind of average. The triggers are decent and springy, and there is a side button that has a, a pretty good click to it. Again, with the use case that I have for the XR4, I don't really use the controllers that much. So somebody that is using this for other PC VR applications might have a better opinion on how these controllers are. I was 
unable to perform the standard FOV test in Steam because of the insanely bad tracking of the controllers. Trying to position the markers at the FOV limits would cause tracking loss and they would just jump all over the place. What I can say is that while in Microsoft Flight Simulator, the horizontal FOV is slightly better than the arrow. The vertical FOV is much larger. And this really helps in a major way with immersion. To put this into an easy to visualize way, here is what this video would look like on the XR4. And here it is on the arrow. Going from the XR4 to any of my other headsets makes you realize that you're in VR because you're viewing everything through a box. It's one of those, you need to see it to believe it scenarios and no amount of me describing it will properly convey the difference. As Vario mentions on their product page, the clarity of the optics spans the full FOV. And this is one thing that they got 100% right. You can't really tell any sort of distortion when looking into the corners. The default for this headset is 48 PPD or pixels per degree. That is already much higher than the arrow at 36 for its default. And it isn't even the max that it can go. You can select a whopping 51 PPD, which sounds like the clear option for the absolute best visual quality. But sadly, at this setting, you won't be able to get anywhere near the required FPS for smooth operation. And although it looks pretty incredible, the low frame rates make it unplayable. Maybe a 5090 will be able to get this thing playable, but for now, it's best to just keep it at the default. Now I will go through the average FPS for Microsoft Flight Simulator for each PPD, so you can see the impact that each step up in density causes. I have a lot of complaints with this headset, but the brightness of those mini LED panels, that's not one of them. I have it set at 75% in the software, and it is bright enough that I have to, have to squint when flying around in clear skies. 200 nits doesn't seem like much when you see numbers like, you know, 1000 and 2000 thrown around for TVs and phones, but you need to remember that the panels in this headset are millimeters away from your eyes, and it's pretty much a near pitch black environment. So even a pretty low brightness level like 200 nits is way more than enough. Now it's also bright without being washed out, which means that you have the capability of it being extremely bright, but it doesn't impact the rest of what you're seeing. So let's say while you're flying around in the simulator in an aircraft, in a, like an airliner, and you look outside and you see the sun directly, it's enough that it's very, very bright. But when you look down, it's dark. So you have that contrast, that difference between the bright and the dark uh, scenes there. Another really high mark for Vario here. The lenses are big, they're clear, and have a massive sweet spot. When you first put on the headset, it is just absolutely mind-blowing how crystal clear and bright everything is. The XR4 uses an aspherical lens, which, without going into too much detail, offers an incredible optical clarity and really low distortion. It also costs a significant amount to manufacture, so it's reserved for higher end headsets like this one. The mini LED panels in the XR4 deserve a lens like this, and this pairing makes for the absolute best VR visuals I have ever experienced. It really isn't even close to any of the other headsets that I have used. It is very clear that this is where the R&D budget went to, and regardless of the mountain of issues that I have with this headset, I keep putting it back on whenever I fire up the sim. It's uh, not good. I want so badly for the tracking on this to live up to the optics that they've stuffed inside. Unfortunately, Vario's decision to transition to inside out tracking, something that's in its second, third, fourth iterations with other companies has been poorly executed. This next take may seem harsh, but hear me out. The Quest 3 is $500 and I can sit in my corner cockpit over there with the lighting that you're seeing here with absolutely no hiccups in the tracking. It is rock solid. With the XR4, I can sit in that exact same position and the tracking is all over the place. Just looking left causes me to float backwards in the cockpit. So now I feel like freaking Zoolander. I can't turn left. Even if I throw the studio lights on that corner to give the best possible lighting conditions, I still float away. There have been a few updates that I will discuss later in the video that were supposed to improve the tracking, which they did. But the improvement was from abysmal to just 
really bad. Eight times the cost of the Quest 3 and tracking that performs like, well, nothing at all because I haven't used a headset that loses tracking so consistently. Vario knows how bad it is because I reached out to their support team to see if this was a common issue and here's how they responded. Let's discuss this, shall we? Keep in mind, this is a $4,000 headset and this is not some alpha version or pre-production unit. This is fully functional. You can buy it on their site. This is production ready. Okay, so in their email, they gave me a few steps <laughs> that I should follow to make sure that I can get the best out of the tracking. So number one, it is advised to power up the headset when it is resting on the floor with the top tracking cameras unobstructed. It's kind of an odd request, but okay. I, I don't really get it, but all right, moving on. Avoid pointing the headset to a flat wall or to objects that are very close to or very far away from the headset when powering it up. So not too far, not too close, not a wall. And so how it, okay, moving on. Direct sunlight and a change of lighting conditions over time can impact the tracking quality. So I don't really have to worry about that here. I got everything closed off. There is no sunlight coming in. That's not an unreasonable request. There are some tracking issues with other headsets if you go into direct sunlight, not a problem. Three, the ceiling and environment should be evenly lit if possible. Some LED light sources can introduce a flicker that is not visible to the human eye, but impacts the tracking cameras. Again, not unreasonable. You do have some LEDs, like they said, that can interfere with the tracking cameras or with the, uh, with the infrared that they're using. Four, reflective and transparent surfaces can cause issues as well. Uh, ideally, the device is used in a spot where there are no windows or mirrors nearby. I have none of those, that shouldn't be a concern. The application should run at a solid 80 frames per second. Now, I don't know how many of you watching this have been on Flight Simulator or DCS or racing sims in general, but to get this kind of visual clarity, this kind of high PPD, high resolution in a game like that, in those simulators, a solid 80 isn't going to work. You're going to be at max like 30. Sometimes you can use like DLS, DLSS to get up past that to like 40, 50. 80 is not going to happen. So right off the bat, they're saying that your tracking is not going to be great unless you're running high frame rates. Well, that's not possible. So moving on. The device is currently tracking pose, so positional tracking, using the top tracking cameras, while the bottom cameras track the controllers. Now that would make a lot of sense because when you use the controllers, the second you start to go up past about here, it loses tracking. So clearly it can't keep tracking because the sensors in the controller aren't good enough to continue with accelerometers to show where you're going. So it just kind of hangs there and you have to come back within view of the camera before it picks it up again. If the walls and ceiling around the headset are just flat surfaces and lacking features, it's advised to add posters, paintings, or photographs to the walls. <laughs> now, my wall on the left, that's why it makes sense that I'm floating backwards like I do in the, uh, in the sim. It's because it's completely flat and it's black. There's no features for it to detect and to lock onto for positional tracking. But, the Quest works just fine in that scenario. So clearly the Quest 3 has the, te has the capability to look at a flat black surface like that and track just fine. This can't. So that is an error on Vario's part. They need to correct that. Maybe they can't correct it because maybe it's a hardware choice that they, uh, that they made, a decision that they made when designing it. But if it's a software issue, they need to correct it and they need to put it out quick. Moving on. High contrast pictures with sharp edges and corners are good. Like the, the ones I have in front, I have the monitor in front and I have a shelf with some different things. I'll show it on there. And it seems to be okay when you're looking straight forward without moving at all. The second you start to move around and look around at different parts of the room here, that's when it loses the tracking. Now I haven't even touched on the tracking of the controllers, which I guess I'll do now. Rather than talk about it, here's a video. Tracking, tracking, tracking and not. Remember in the email where they said the top cameras are for pose and then the bottom are for controllers? Well, no surprise when you lift the controller up out of view, it loses tracking. If they can update the firmware to use all exterior cameras for both positional tracking 
and controller tracking, maybe there will be an improvement, but for now, well, it's, it's unusable. Now, I've been using the Arrow since its release, and overall, I'll say that it has been pretty much issue-free until about a month ago. I'm active on all the DCS and Microsoft Flight Simulator forums, and I heard so many people complaining about crashes, errors, and other countless problems. Having never experienced any of these issues, I always thought that this was a problem with like third-party software or some other configuration. Nope. I started having the sim crash on me and errors connecting the arrow to a clean install of Windows with the latest drivers, the latest versions, and no additional software. A fresh install of Windows and all programs did fix the issue, but this just isn't an option for most people. Now we have base 4.2.2, which supports the XR4. And from my initial testing, it seems to be more stable during startup and operation for the Arrow. But that's not what we're here for. Since the XR4 has been released, there have been a handful of base updates released to address various issues like the tracking and the mixed reality cameras. With the latest release from April 20th, I can safely say that improvements have been made. Unfortunately, it's not enough to make the headset anywhere close to usable. Earlier in the video, I spoke of the tracking issues and how bad the pass-through was. This update addressed some of those issues, but didn't really fix any of them. It just made it slightly less bad. There are also software bugs aplenty, which range from going into a display port, connecting, reconnecting, disconnecting, connecting loop that never stops, to telling me to flip the USB-C cable over 180 degrees because it isn't fast enough. Yeah. That was a weird one to see. You also can't use this with more than one monitor connected, something that really impacts my setup. And finally, only Nvidia cards are supported. So, sorry AMD users. There are a handful of specs for the XR4 that make it the absolute best headset on the market right now. The incredible brightness of the mini LED displays and the deep blacks that they can achieve combined with the massive vertical field of view make this headset such a treat to fly with. Unfortunately, it all falls apart from there. The controllers are uncomfortable and lose tracking. The software works maybe 20% of the time. The inside out tracking is so unreliable that you'll be spending most of your flight outside of the aircraft. And the pass-through cameras are worse than the now ancient Quest 2. To put it simply, the XR4 feels like more of a concept to display high-end optics rather than a product up for sale. Vario has hopped on the bandwagon of tech companies that release products with capabilities that aren't available at purchase. I cannot stress this enough. This headset is absolutely not for the mainstream consumer, and you should not even consider buying it unless you're an industrial use customer. Having said that, if you have $4,000 laying around, then you really can't find a better headset for resolution and brightness. This is until the Pimax Crystal Super comes out, which I'm hoping to get my hands on for review. What I'm hoping is that this is just basically a concept vehicle for what's eventually gonna trickle down into the successor to the Arrow. For that, we do want a higher resolution, always. The lenses are great. Not having base stations is a huge bonus. And also having any sort of audio on there is definitely better. So if they can take this, improve on it for the successor to the Arrow, decrease it by a quarter of the price, then we might have something worth looking into. That's gonna do it for today. I hope this was informative and gave you an insight into some of the hardware that Vario is working with, which might find its way into a consumer version soon. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and I'll see you in the next one.